what could be more fun than speaking to you tonight about sex and making babies, right? But before you get too excited, let me tell you, making babies in the future will be much less intimate. We are on the verge of creating new humans, a scientific revolution that will change the world more than probably automobiles, iPhones, and electronics. It will pose immense dilemmas, and we, we are not ready for them. In the summer of 1978, I <laughs> was a young medical student visiting Manchester in England. I read in the newspaper that the first test tube baby was born in Oldham, about an hour drive from Manchester. Robert Edwards and Patrick Steptoe succeeded in getting an egg from the ovary of an infertile patient, fertilize it in the lab, and getting an embryo and putting it back into her womb. Louise Brown, the first IVF in vitro fertilization baby in the history of mankind, was born. I run immediately to one of the senior gynecologists and tell him, what do you think about this? And his unforgettable answer, don't be naive. It's a fraud. It will never be possible to do something like this. Just to tell you and show you how inconceivable this was back then. Robert Edwards received the Nobel Prize in medicine for this achievement. In 1982, I'm a young first three year resident at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Sheba Medical Center in Israel. I assist Professor Mashiach and Professor Dor in the cesarean section of the first Israeli IVF child. We are in the operation room, surrounded by journalists, microphones, cameras, and then the unforgettable and exciting delivery of a baby girl, perfect, beautiful, and since then, she became a very clever and impressive woman. Witnessing these historic IVF moments motivated me to become a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the very same Sheba Medical Center. I have dedicated the last 35 years to the study, research, and clinical treatment of many infertile people. And I still get very excited when patients longing for a child for many years come to me and I am able, after agonizing treatments and disappointments they had, to help them get pregnant. Thanks to ART, which stands for Artificial Reproductive Technologies, we are able to perform the miracle of the gift of new life. IVF and ART have made already significant changes. One in seven couples around the world is infertile. More than 10 million IVF babies have been born already. Imagine what these IVF children, who otherwise would not have been born, what impact they had on their parents, on their family, on society, on the world. On the other hand, birth rates around the world are declining in many countries. Having children is becoming a rarer and more uncommon experience for many. Therefore, it is not surprising that many future parents want to know more, want to have better control over their reproductive outcome. I, for example, encounter patients who want to know and choose the gender of their future child. And this is just one of the possibilities. Is IVF becoming more and more a negotiable commodity? A typical IVF lab contains rows of embryo incubators that house sometimes hundreds of embryos at a time. We observe them with cameras, microscopes. We diagnose their chemical behavior. We diagnose their genetic makeup by taking a biopsy. Therefore, we know more and more about the state and the future fertility potential of these embryos. Already today, up to 40% of IVF cycles in the US include some type 
of genetic testing. And it is predicted that our genetic abilities to diagnose the genetic traits and the behavioral traits of the embryos will grow and will become more intense. We'll be able to diagnose the genetics and the traits of embryos that they will carry for the rest of their lives. Imagine you undergo an IVF treatment with extensive genetic testing. You come and I show you the report cards of your embryos and you have to decide which one to choose and to put into the womb. For embryo number one, the report card says it'll be a boy. Projected height, 175 meters. Hair, brown, eyes, brown, athletic, with a high risk towards heart disease, ADHD, dyslexia, and depression. <laughs> Embryo number two, she will be a girl. 155 meters projected height. She will be blonde, blue-eyed, with a high risk towards obesity, diabetes, heart disease, breast cancer. And so on and so forth for embryo number three, four, and five. What do you do as a future parent? How do you decide? What is our role as consulting medical staff? And the better we get with our diagnosis, the more we know, the longer and longer and longer the report card will be. Imagine. At one point, you'll get a report card saying, don't replace this embryo. He will never get married and will stay in your basement for the next 40 years. <laughs> At this point, I understand that some of you say, come on, leave me alone. I don't want to be in this game of selecting an embryo and choosing which one to put in the womb. We are going to continue making it the old-fashioned way, with romantic music, with candlelight, but others will say, why? Why shouldn't I know about my future children as much as possible? I want them to be gifted. I want them to be healthy. I want them to be clever. I want them to be as beautiful as can be, right? And from there on, sliding down the slippery slope is a certainty. Unless political, legal, ethical, philosophical, Religious considerations come into play, and regulations are being put up. Did I say regulations? Yes, we need regulations. But already today, we have different regulations for IVF and ART in different countries. Can we achieve one global regulation? And what if not? I'm not here to scare you. Genetics, biotechnology, selection of embryos can have major benefits, and I'll tell you some of them. One, we could reduce the incidence of genetic diseases around the world. Two, improvement of personal and societal health and saving of billions or trillions in health dollars. And three, equality. Everyone can have a perfect a good embryo to choose from. But what is a good embryo? How do you choose your best embryo? And what about the doubts, the regrets that can then linger for a lifetime? Imagine these parents after a discussion with their rebellious teenager. I told you not to put this one. We should have put the other one. But you have always to have your right. And if we have good embryos, what about the bad embryos, the discarded ones? I was diagnosed at the age of 17 with insulin-dependent diabetes. What if my parents would have known that and would have discarded me? I would not exist. All whatever I did would not have been done, at least by me. And you could not listen to me tonight, could you? Medicine knows that human giants had severe diseases. Leonardo da Vinci, for example, 
had severe ADHD. Michelangelo had borderline autism. Newton and Churchill were probably both manic depressives. President Roosevelt had a very debilitating neurologic disease. What if they would have been discarded? Would we have the Mona Lisa, the Sistine Chapel, the laws of gravity? Would the Second World War have ended differently? Overcoming imperfection is very often the heroic path towards greatness. Are we going to have different types of humans? The selected Petri dish in the laboratory made embryos and the non-selected made the old-fashioned way by having sex? Will the unselected children be regarded as a major health and economic burden on society because they might carry preventable and undetected yet genetic diseases? Another important point that I encounter in my daily practice is the psychology and the, its effects on interpersonal relationships of IVF and ART. Making children in the lab is not very romantic. We ship very often eggs, sperms, embryos from faraway fertility banks. We replace falling in love, blind dates and sexual encounters with express shipping. I can see already in the near future. Big ads on the internet. Prime day beautiful embryos for sale. 50% off Black Friday on tech gear, appliances, and perfect human embryos. And if you are not happy, money back guarantee, right? <laughs> and the answer to the eternal question will change forever. Mommy, where do babies come from? <laughs> Selecting embryos will just be the first step. Why not improve on my best embryo? Changing genes, gene editing is already being applied around the world. We are on the verge of designer babies or babies on demand. About a year ago, a Chinese scientist claimed that he had edited the genes of embryos in the lab and they delivered two baby girls immune to HIV. The world, although his, his, his scientific claim was not yet corroborated, shook in tremor and in fear. Are scientists already working on developing secretly and uncontrolled, engineered a new breed of Super superior humans? Another very important development is the artificial womb. Designed in order to keep very immature fetuses outside of the body until they are mature, they are in a controlled and in a controllable environment. Is this a new technological pregnancy without weight gain and heaviness? but without pregnancy diseases? Is this a new step towards gender equality? I've shown you that biotechnology and genetics are going to change the way we will make our babies in the future. Sex will be out, ART will be in and when I say in, I happen to have in my pocket an IVF Petri dish. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where we are going to make our babies in the future. And if you are getting afraid, I hope, and I'm quite sure, sex will remain with us, but just for fun. As a father, as a physician, as a scientist, as an optimist, I hope very much that we will find the middle way between the immense possible benefits 
of genetics and biotechnology and still maintain important human values, maintain humanity. Right now, we have more questions than answers. About a year ago, scientists requested a global moratorium on gene editing. There are several committees discussing the subject. I'm afraid that their pace is too slow in view of the huge tsunami that is brewing silently behind us and could flood us very, very soon. Therefore, I urge every one of you to try to understand the subject better and to be active in the discussion. Global complex solutions need very often the support and the wisdom of many. A type of global grassroots movement could supply us the basis for widespread, uniform regulation and give us the political and ethical strength for control. We are dealing with a subject that is hot and getting hotter and we must deal with it as soon as possible. Because it is about the future of our human race it is about the future of humanity, nothing less. Thank you.